from a spark to an inferno. Under the right conditions, fires can explode beyond our control in a matter of seconds. You just can't do nothing. You just can't stop it. Recent wildfires have become so extreme, they're creating their own weather systems. We are looking at an epidemic of bad fires around the world. Choking smog. Villages razed to the ground. Even fire tornadoes. Holy shit. The 2003 fires that hit Canberra are now the most scientifically important bushfires ever. And tragedies of our own making. In the Rhode Island case, a lot of lessons were learned. It's pretty much the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. What fueled the world's biggest firestorms? Who was to blame? And how did they grow so catastrophic so quickly? Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? As the sun rose on the searingly hot morning of February 7th, 2009, Australian fire crews woke to a feeling of dread. No stranger to big and destructive wildfires, they knew conditions today were far worse than any in living memory. If you knew anything about fire, you knew that something horrendous was going to happen. The lead up to Black Saturday was a very, very prolonged, intense drought. So the landscape was being primed, it was crackling. And then we get a particular synoptic setup where basically you transport the hot, dry, arid air masses at speed down into the temperate part of Australia. Victoria, Australia's southeast state, had been baking in an exceptional heat wave. On the day of Australia's deadliest fires, the mercury rocketed past 46 degrees Celsius, with winds gusting at 70 kilometers an hour. People were saying that this was going to be one of the worst fire days in memory. Black Saturday had arrived. Because it was so hot, the atmosphere actually looked like what you might expect over the desert. The heat from the surface was mixed through about five kilometres above the ground, which is quite unusual. And if you've got ignitions in already a primed landscape, you can imagine how those fires are going to burn. If the temperature goes up a little bit, the fuel dries out very fast, and they're the fuels that carry a fire along the landscape. Several fires were already ablaze by the morning. Then just before midday, high winds triggered a power line failure, setting grasslands alight in Kilmore East. You just can't do nothing. You just can't stop it. Within minutes, the fire was uncontainable. Earth is the only planet that burns, 
because it contains the three ingredients essential to fire. Fuel, oxygen, and heat. Otherwise known as the fire triangle. It's carbon-based life that provides the ample fuel and produces oxygen in just the right amount. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. If there were any less oxygen, we wouldn't be able to sustain a combustion reaction. And if there were much more, then the fire would burn uncontrollably. Life provides both the fuel in the form of carbon and the oxygen fire needs to thrive. Fire is a extraordinarily complicated process because you have to sink energy into a system to start creating more energy, and then you can create a feedback. As the fuel is heated, it will start to break down chemically. Hydrocarbons split and combine with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water vapor. The process releases heat, which becomes the driving force of more fire. The molecules break down and they release gases which are flammable. And it's mostly those flammable gases that carry the fire. And those odd gases that are being emitted suddenly start burning. Of the three ingredients in the fire triangle, fuel is the one we are best able to control before a fire begins. Understanding how different materials combust and drive the spread of flames it's critical to saving lives, particularly when it comes to fires that begin in the home. In 2017, the world watched in horror as London's Grenfell Tower burned through the night, full of desperate residents waiting to be rescued. People was crying, people died, people screaming. From the way the 24-story building burned like a torch, many fire experts immediately suspected a highly flammable exterior. It was moving extremely fast in an upward direction. And I was thinking to myself, at that point, this guy, it has to have that cladding on it. As you got to the top, like, you could see uh, children uh, screaming at the top as well. We have seen a number of fires with combustible exterior cladding. And for one reason or another, whether it's in China, such as at the China Central Broadcasting, or in the Middle East at the building known as the Torch, in a tall building, there's really no way to stop it. The fire began just before midnight with faulty electrics on a hot point fridge on the fourth floor. Within half an hour, it was out of control. The fire broke through the window and proceeded to ignite the exterior cladding system, which served to accelerate the fire growth. The cladding was made of sheets of aluminium containing a polyethylene insulation material which provided a vertical racetrack for the flames. They're made of the same hydrocarbon-based materials that you find in gasoline. That's functionally what, what they are. Many residents tragically advised by the fire department to stay in their apartments and wait for help to arrive, lost their early chance of making it out alive. In some countries, that is a standard firefighting procedure and it's intended to facilitate fire department operations. I don't know why the fire brigade he didn't break the glass to tell, to tell the people to go out. 
I haven't heard no alarm. I only heard in my house smoke alarm. The lack of multiple fire exits had been a source of complaints even before the Grenfell Inferno. There was only one staircase, which allowed both the firefighters to make access, but it also was used for egress from the victims. So there was chaos in the single staircase. The fire stairs was on this side where it was already burning, so they couldn't get down. If you've ever been in a tall building and tried to exit down the stairs, it's much more difficult than you think, especially when everyone else in the building is trying to exit at the same time. Combine that with smoky conditions and spread to the outside so they couldn't safely enter the building and control the fire. The amount of heat produced by that is not to be underestimated. You can't even get near the building at some point. Although 100 firefighters managed to get inside the building, they simply couldn't reach the people trapped on higher floors. People were jumping off buildings, people were screaming, help me, help me, help me. By the time the fire had burned itself out, 71 people had perished. The deaths generally will be caused first by smoke. General statistics from the National Fire Protection Association suggest that more than 75% of fire deaths are related to smoke inhalation. The smoke travels ahead of the fire and is very deadly, so you don't need to actually be exposed to the direct heat of the fire to succumb. The carbon monoxide basically take the place of where oxygen should be in your red blood cells, so it starves your, your brain, your muscles of oxygen. You effectively suffocate. Products that are petroleum-based or foam-based are going to put off a, a higher level of smoke than, say, for instance, a burning piece of wood. Aside from a single fire exit and highly flammable exterior, there was another fatal flaw in fire safety management that undoubtedly cost many lives. A lack of sprinklers. To my knowledge and my experience in the fire protection industry, there's never been a fatality in a sprinkler building. I am an advocate that these buildings need to be retrofitted to protect the occupants, no matter what the cost, because you cannot buy a life. I think that there's a high probability that there would be very few, if any, fatalities if the building had been sprinklered. Fire is not always a destructive force. Our planet has evolved alongside it, and fires sweeping through the landscape in the right balance can be a powerful driver of renewal. Fires are very traumatic, but they're also that amazing sunrise of all of this life suddenly coming up after the catastrophe. Smoke can be a cue for germination and for flowering. You have ash beds, which is very nutrient rich. There's light, they've removed pathogens in the soil. It's perfect for rapid growth. Australia has always known big bushfires. Its dominant tree, the eucalypt, can't live without it. But their leaves are full of flammable oils. And once fires reach the canopy, a small ground fire can explode into a terrifying, all-consuming firestorm in a matter of minutes. There's another house going up the back. This is what happened on Black Saturday. The Kilmore East fire began as a low energy grass fire, racing across paddocks in the strong, gusty winds. When it hit pine and eucalypt forests, its behavior became extreme. It's so unpredictable. It's been blowing this way one minute and then it's been going that way the next. Winds were already estimated at 100 kilometers an hour. 
and the fire was beginning to create its own self-sustaining weather. So as the fire burns fuel, it releases heat and water vapor into the atmosphere, which make it warmer than the air around it. And that air rises, and as it does, it pulls in other air at the base. Sometimes these winds created by the fire are the dominant force spreading the fire. On the ground, fire crews struggled to breathe, describing the fires as sucking the oxygen out of the air. The wind's getting up, and uh, you can see it's tightening the tray behind you. And then, of course, there's a really horrifying extra dimension. The fires eject fires ahead of them, spotted, as it's called. You could imagine how terrifying that must be that you're in a safe place and suddenly there may be a fire burning in front of you because the fire has literally leapt kilometres. Spot fires were being created as far as 40 kilometres ahead of the fire front. In some cases, turning into major fires themselves. You couldn't fight it. I mean, you know, that's, that's a, you, you just couldn't do that. Firefighting aircraft were deployed, but there was a limit to how much they could achieve. The problem with aerial firefighting is an expectation in the society that whenever there's a fire, there will be a bomber. But under certain circumstances, these aerial firefighting techniques just can't work. The fires are too intense. The intensity of large forest fires means that prevention is often the only way to manage them. There's two concepts that people get confused about involving the active use of fire to manage fires, and there's the preemptive or elective use of fire. That's often called planned burning or prescribed burning, and that's a way of reducing fuel loads. Prescribed burning is done on specially chosen days during the cooler months of the year, when fire is less likely to escape control. Back burning, on the other hand, is an emergency procedure. Right now, the purpose of this operation is to try to hold the fire. Firefighters will choose to light a fire and they're burning back into the head fire. Hey Cody, when you come down, watch out for the barbed wire right here. And basically what they're doing is that they're trying to starve the fire of the fuel it needs. Again, it's a very dangerous procedure. If it goes wrong, you could actually make a fire bigger or worse, but it's a very important technique Aerial firefighting is equally risky and much more expensive. Aerial firefighting, certainly to put out small fires, incredibly important, but it's not a cure. Before you know it, we're wanting to spend more and more of the budget with these aircraft, sucking up all of the resources for the preventative measures that could reduce the risk to communities and reduce fuel loads and fire hazard in the landscape. Ironically, one of the main factors contributing to a recent string of devastating fires in the US is their century of fire suppression policy. This ideology has turned forests into a dense and verdant fire trap. Add increasingly warm conditions to the mix, and fires are reaching record intensities and sizes. It's brought a new term into the scientific literature, megafire. California's most destructive wildfires in history began on a Sunday night. They swept through Santa Rosa at speed with little warning. Many were asleep. There was no time to save anything. We didn't have time to think about what to grab. We grabbed what we saw. 
The next day, residents stumbled through the smoking ruins of their city in shock. Home right there. John, that looks like a bomb went off. The total incineration of some areas left forensic teams without even DNA to work with. My mother calls me. She says, I can't, I can't get out. There's fire everywhere. She tells me she's going to die. She can't get out of her house. In some cases, the serial numbers of artificial joints and implants were the only clues to who had perished. Aluminium hubcaps melted into the gutters. Many months after, investigators still weren't sure what sparked the main tub's fire on the 8th of October, 2017. There'd been a very protracted drought in California. Then there'd been uh, a very wet spring, which meant that there was a tremendous amount of spring growth. Then, surprisingly, the summer was very, very hot and dry, so that fine fuel dried out. At the end of the fire season, the rains never materialised. Most people at that point would have thought the fire season was really throttled right back. With autumn came the dreaded Diablo winds. Hot, dry winds blowing in from the interior of the continent. Diablo winds are associated with air masses being pushed over mountains under really high pressures has been dried out as it passes over a mountain and then pushes down the slope and comes down at tremendous force. Weather conditions were lining up and the landscape was primed for a burning. A spark was all that was needed. Reports were made of power lines breaking and transformers exploding and it's suspected that those might have been the ignition of the fires. The main blaze erupted at 9.43 p.m. Fanned by gusting winds of over 140 kilometers an hour. Fires normally like to burn upslope, but these winds are so strong that the flames are being bent down over and catching the fuel in front of them and they're just rushing down. It was very unusual in terms of how fast it spread. It spread more than 12 miles in a little over three hours. Where are my wife and kids? As the fire roared towards the city of Santa Rosa, emergency services raced to evacuate tens of thousands of residents. Go! Go! More than 3,000 buildings burned down that night, despite many fire crews on the ground. When a fire has very tall flame lengths and it's spreading really fast, often there's very little they can do. The priority in those situations are to save lives. Oh, she's disabled. All right, all right, let me get her feet. Let me get her feet. Her husband's right behind you. Sheriff, one stand before we're doing a carry out. Ready? Fighting fires at night is so much harder than fighting a fire in the daytime in terms of just organizing evacuations, just another level of complexity. After it swept through Santa Rosa, the fires jumped Highway 101, ramping up to speeds of 100 kilometers an hour. Fire was spotting well ahead of itself. Exploding across Northern California's wine country, it burned an acre a minute. So then suddenly you had a firestorm burning into agricultural landscapes, vineyards, and settlements where most people had disconnected from the risk of fire disasters. Oh man, this is you right here? Trying to salvage what's going to be up in flames here. It's like pretty soon. You know, the probability of that happening, you're getting a really bad jackpot there. By Wednesday 10th, more towns were in jeopardy. All 5,000 residents of Calistoga were asked to leave that night, as well as smaller communities of Geyserville and Boys Hot Springs in Sonoma. Exhausted fire crews tried to backburn to slow the fires. 
You're doing a backfire along the road, creating a, a larger buffer along this roadway. More than 11,000 firefighters battled several blazes across hundreds of thousands of acres in the Northern California wildfires. Extra crews were flown in from Canada and Australia, some working 80 hours straight to save lives and homes. By the time the fires were contained, the toll was staggering. 43 people lost their lives, many in their homes or right near them. More than 8,000 buildings burnt down, and losses totaled a billion dollars. And we're back here today for the first time, and as you can see, devastation, there's nothing left. So. As horrendous as the Australian Black Saturday fires were in their first few hours, they were about to get much, much worse. A cool change was coming. A cool change should bring relief, and ultimately it does, but the fact that the cool change does have this dramatic impact on the fire direction of travel can make it quite dangerous. The most ferocious part of a fire is the head fire. As the dry, hot winds drove the fire front onwards, long, skinny flank fires were left in their wake. The respite, if there wasn't a fire, is the cool change. But the respite is actually when the bad things happen. At 5.30 p.m., the wind swung around from a hot desert northwesterly to a cool southwesterly, blowing in from the ocean. Instead of welcome relief, it brought catastrophe. So if you've got a fire which has been burning under a certain wind direction, if that wind changes, say, 90 degrees, then the long flanks of the fire can turn into a head fire. The flank fires morphed into gigantic head fires. Oh, pretty bad, isn't it? A lot of people can be caught unawares because they're thinking the fire is burning over there that way, where suddenly it's coming straight at you. The fire at the edge of King Lake changed direction and consumed the town. Couldn't get out of town, so we just went down to the roundabout down there and watched the town burn. And it was just like that, all gone. With the fire front stretching for kilometers, roads became impassable. Trapped, residents had no way out. The most tragic thing is that the decision to go was left too late, and then people were killed trying to flee. We lost our home, I lost my car and everything on my back. In the final count, the Black Saturday fires claimed 173 lives. The outcome was so horrendous, it led to a new fire danger rating. Catastrophic. The Black Saturday fire was right outside the range of historical variability. I mean, this was stretching the imagination of seasoned firefighters. Fire could be doing absolutely nothing. Within half an hour, it could be, you know, off and running again. In the post-fire assessment, it was said the total energy released by the wildfires was equivalent to 1,500 of the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima. The consequences of all that energy being released in a short period of time can have dramatic effects on atmospheric conditions, creating a literal firestorm. These are really generating tremendous energy and they're ejecting into the atmosphere matter and heat and water vapour. These are what we scientifically call a coupling between the fire and the atmosphere. A cumulonimbus without fire is terrifying enough. A massive thundercloud capable of creating severe weather, like tornadoes. Oh my God! 
Large fires can provide all the ingredients a cumulonimbus needs to form. Massive, heated updrafts of moisture and instability in the atmosphere. As fire risk increases across the world, and we see a greater frequency of large, intense fires, the pyrocumulonimbus, or pyro-CB phenomenon, is becoming a hot scientific topic. Well, the reports of a thunderstorm in the uh, smoke plume, that's automatically into uh, unusual territory in fires. In Australia, we've worked out now we've entered an era of these fire thunderstorms. From the start of satellite monitoring in 1978 until 2001, in Australia we had two known and two possible pyro CB events. Since 2001, we've confirmed another 56. In 2003, a wildfire near Australia's capital city, Canberra, spawned one of the most famous pyro CB events in history. It gave birth to the first scientifically documented fire tornado. Just like the Black Saturday bushfires, a huge area was alight just before the cloud formed. We had a dry lightning storm move over the Australian Alps and it lit lots and lots of fires. A lot of them defied initial suppression actions and they kept brewing across the landscape. The fires tore through the national park surrounding Australia's bush capital. And by the morning of January 18th, 70% of the dense forests were ablaze all the fires in our area had merged, and that settled in at about 275,000 hectares. Notify any unit that's in the forestry settlement to evacuate immediately. By 9 a.m., residents were battling spot fires, and emergency services were hastily retreating into the suburbs. What could have caused a fire to consume so much forest in less than 10 days? We had observers flying around, and they were the first to see things that were truly weird are going on. Scans showed the answer lay in a previously unknown interaction between fire and the rugged terrain. Normally, if you get a fire starting at a point, it will head in the direction of the wind, forming a, you know, roughly a, a long sort of oval shape. Well, these scans showed fire spreading almost perpendicular to the way the wind should have been pushing it. So a sort of a right angled kink in the back of the fire line. It stood out because there was nothing really in the literature which said that fire should spread in a direction 90 degrees to the way the wind's trying to push it. The fires are just all around us. Can be completely surrounded by fire at the moment. It's just scary stuff. In each instance, the fire spread laterally along the lee facing slopes, those protected from the wind, which are usually considered the safest side from a fire. This fire behavior was named vorticity-driven lateral fire spread. As the wind drives the inferno up the slope, it separates from the hill at the crest, barreling over itself to create a horizontal eddy. The eddy simultaneously halts and stokes the flames at the ridgeline, forcing it to spread laterally. So you sort of have the fire spreading across, but at the same time, spreading embers downwind, which then light up large tracts of land. We're talking about leaves and branches and all sorts of stuff being just sucked up into the atmosphere and then blasted forward, raining down sparks into the bush. So you've got this horrifying capacity of these fires to literally explode across landscapes. By 3 p.m., an eerie twilight of smoke and flame had descended on Canberra, and the first houses ignited in the suburbs. Smoke occurs when combustion is incomplete. This can be caused because the ignition temperatures are not hot enough and result in smoldering, or because of the presence of materials other than carbon in the fuel source. Wood, for example, is not made of pure carbon but contains a mix of carbon, volatiles, water, and minerals. In the absolute purest form, the smoke 
that would be coming out of a perfect fire would actually be invisible. It would just be CO2. The smoke we see is often some of the gases which are coming off and then they can condense into little globules and they are actually quite toxic. In confined spaces, toxic smoke can kill in minutes. Barely a month after the Canberra bushfires, the station nightclub fire in Rhode Island would take the lives of 100 people. As the band Great White started their first set, pyrotechnics were set off on either side of the stage. It happened to be pointed directly at this polyurethane foam sound insulation. Within seconds, the highly flammable foam was alight. It was a petroleum-based product, and it was easily ignitable, and the fire spread quickly through this material because of its lack of fire retardant product built into the foam. Within 36 seconds, you had your first calls to 911. By the time the fire services had arrived, five minutes into the blaze, the building was engulfed in flames. People are running out on fire. It's pretty much, pretty, probably the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. The last survivor made it out the main exit just five minutes and 30 seconds after the fire started. My sister and I were at the front of the stage and as soon as I saw it going up, the foam padding, I grabbed her and, and we went right out the back. The investigation of the station nightclub fire disaster involved many local, state, and federal agencies. The fire scene was processed in the days after, involving a forensic archaeologist and representatives of NIST. Subsequent to that disaster, the National Institute of Standards and Technology conducted a number of studies. When it actually happens and the fire spreads as quickly as it does, there is a need to be able to revisit that fire in that building to say, what happened? At no time did my brother or I have any knowledge that pyrotechnics were going to be used by the band Great White. There were a number of requirements that they had contravened. First and foremost, the use of pyrotechnics. No permission was ever requested by the band or any of its agents to use pyrotechnics at the station, and no permission was ever given in combination with a untreated non-fire retardant polyurethane foam. That was the fundamental flaw. Fire retardant foam was double the price, an extra $6 for every person who perished. To study how the fire progressed, the NIST rebuilt the stage and main room using the same materials. Just as it did on the night, the fire rapidly spreads across the polyurethane foam. A ceiling of black, toxic smoke begins to descend just 50 seconds in. That smoke can be a few hundred degrees. That's similar to if you touch a hot stove, your finger will blister. So as you breathe it in, you effectively sear your lungs. When your lungs blister, uh, effectively you drown in your own bodily fluids. By one minute and 20 seconds after ignition, there is barely any visible space. Anybody inside? The smoke, heat, and fire prevented many occupants from reaching the exit quickly, and many didn't realize there was more than one. The club was above capacity, and interestingly, the station nightclub had four exits. The majority of people, believe it or not, when they go into a building, the only exit they know is the one that they entered into. The main exit was two large double doors, but escape was severely hampered by a much smaller door in the hallway leading to the exit, as well as a ticket booth. When you look at the, what's called the death map, which is where they find the bodies, 
a significant number of people were literally crammed into the main exit. And people will fall and they will start to stack up like cordwood. People cannot move because they're wedged in the exit. There were three other exit doors in the kitchen, the bar, and the stage door, but they were not obvious to patrons. I talked to a man who said he pulled about six people from the window. One door even swung inwards. In the legal battle that followed, the tour manager was given a prison sentence. This court will therefore sentence you to 15 years at the ACI. Although they fought the charges, the nightclub owners were also fined and one sent to jail. I will never forget that night and I will never forget the people that were hurt by it. I am so sorry. Smoke inhalation is the primary cause of death in structural fires. And in large scale wildfires, it can be just as hazardous. The Russian wildfires in the summer of 2010 were remarkable for their long-lived and extensive peat fires, which were almost impossible to put out. Burning peat is the classic smoldering combustion. So very thick smoke, which can come out of these fires, extraordinary quantities of smoke. When it's smoldering fires, as often occurs in peat fires, it can release many other different chemicals, such as carbon monoxide, which is bad for human health. Moscow is surrounded by peat fields, boggy ground containing large amounts of decayed vegetation. It's rich in carbon and usually water saturated. But even these had dried out enough to catch fire. Once you get fires going into the ground, they're extremely difficult to control. Literally, you're fighting a fire underground. Putting them out requires an enormous volume of water. Often what can happen with these underground smoldering fires is you can put water onto them and it just can evaporate that water off. Russian soldiers and firefighters were pumping over 400 litres a minute into the bogs, but still couldn't quench them. The haze and smoke blanketing Moscow was so thick and dense that face masks were even being worn indoors. Russian fires had actually blanketed Moscow and affected a huge population for a very long time. The toll on human health was extreme, with around 56,000 people dying from the combined effects of the fires, heat wave, and smoke. 62 people died from the fires themselves, only a tiny fraction of the total tally. So there were very strong, settled, high pressure that got stuck there for a while, and it had been quite dry even before then, and it, it got unusually hot there. You see that they fight all the temperature records. Никогда в стране нашей такое не было, и нет опыта, так сказать, ликвидации вот такой вот ситуации в таких условиях. Temperatures were 10 to 12 degrees above normal for a long length of time, and thousands of fires broke out across Russia. All of these events that we're seeing around the world have all got peculiar climatologies, particularly combinations of drought, wind, heat. 
which in various formats in different environments will be creating uncontrollable and epic fires, which we're seeing increasingly all around the world. The epic fires in Australia's capital city in 2003 were no exception. Leave the area, please. Place evacuation. Please leave the area. Creating ideal conditions for the formation of one of the most dangerous weather phenomena known to man. The fire was affecting, I'd estimate, over 10,000 cubic kilometres of the air. The impacts of these are just incredible. As huge tracts of the landscape were alight, it produced the deep flaming needed for a massive pyrocumulonimbus to form. As the firestorm barreled into the outer suburbs of Canberra, crews were unable to beat back the blaze. We had the damage impacts on the urban edge. There were some houses that were damaged by wind without fire, and the way the debris was removed from these houses, roof tiles and bricks and things five kilometres away from where these houses were destroyed. In a nearby plantation, pine trees had been snapped off at the base in a vortex pattern. So we had the pine plantation flattened in a path that indicated a rotating air mass. This path had the characteristic breaks in the line of wind damage that proved this was a true tornado, rather than the much more common fire worm. The fire tornado, like a true tornado, it was able to lift off the ground in a few places and reattach. Fire whirls cannot lift off and reattach. Fire whirls form when powerful updrafts suck flames into a spiral. But these are attached to the ground, while tornadoes are attached to the base of a rotating thunderstorm forming when horizontal funnels of air are pushed up into a vertical position. Holy shit. The evidence suggests that it's at least an F2 on the modified Fujita scale, which is what the Americans use for measuring tornado intensity. Fire crews were completely unprepared for the magnitude of the disaster. Papa 3 is burning on the side of the road. 500 homes and four lives were lost. It was only in the aftermath that emergency services realized that something extraordinary had happened. Research into the 2003 Canberra fires was the first to scientifically document a fire tornado. As the climate changes, and temperatures across the world continue to break records. Fire behavior is becoming more unpredictable. We haven't seen a major fire disaster yet. We've only seen the prelude to a major fire disaster. I'm convinced there's something building in the background which is going to just leave everybody speechless. Although we can do much to control building fires and save lives, the future we face on the outside is much more uncertain. To say, why can't fire scientists or climate scientists give us a very clear probability statement of what's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years? The reason we can't do that is because it is horrifyingly complicated. The worry is that this interactive system, it's replete with feedbacks, and that's going to be really challenging for the biodiversity because by definition they've never experienced anything like that and it's going to be really challenging for disaster management and it's going to be really challenging for our societies. For those unlucky enough to be caught by one of these big fire disasters and lucky enough to have survived, it's a long road to recovery. Like John Wayne used to say, good Lord willing and the river don't rise. We'll be back home again.
Ours is a restless planet, where mountains swell on surging tides of molten rock. Every minute, somewhere on Earth, a volcano is erupting. People get lulled into a sense of security that if there hasn't been an eruption for a while, well, maybe the volcano has become long-term dormant or even extinct. Unseen and underwater, slow and forceful, or violent and explosive. Volcanoes are as dangerous as they are awe-inspiring. It's a constant battle for rescuers, and the best way to prevent it from happening is to ensure that evacuations happen before the volcano erupts. While their destructive power is merciless, they're also essential for life on Earth. Millions of people around the world live on or near active volcanoes. It's hot magma interacting with groundwater, and that's an explosive combination. For billions of years, volcanoes have landscaped the Earth, shaped our atmosphere, driven evolution, and more recently, changed the course of human history. How do we prepare for the ever-present danger of volcanic eruption? And what kind of warning should we expect? Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind, as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? On the island of Java, Mount Merapi is Indonesia's most active volcano. Towering nearly three kilometers high, smoke can often be seen coming from the summit. Merapi looms over the sprawling city of Yogyakarta and its 400,000 residents. It's in a country that's one of the most densely populated on Earth. So millions and millions of people live within close vicinity of Mount Merapi. So even if that volcano has a really small eruption, the impacts can often be quite widespread. But this was to be no small eruption. In late October 2010, Merapi started to shudder. Avalanches were reported. Volcanologists measured seismic activity increasing to 500 volcanic earthquakes in just one weekend. Their instruments indicated that molten rock, or magma, had risen to about a kilometer below the surface. Tapi kalau dalam keadaan siaga ini, bagi penduduk utamanya di sekitar kali-kali yang berulu di puncak, tetap dalam keadaan siaga juga, karena sewaktu-waktu kemungkinan bisa terjadi letusan. There are many volcanoes where we get those signals and then everything fizzles. In the case of Merapi, when you start to see that convergence of factors, you can be pretty sure that something is going to happen. Ominously, a lava dome threatened to overspill the crater. Lava domes are formed by magma that's too sticky to flow, so it erupts onto the surface and piles up around the vent. This one was expanding by nearly four times its size every day. This is a dome of lava that's growing, and that is one of the potential hazards, independent of an active eruption. 
You can have a dome, which is essentially a big mound of rock that can gradually grow, or even if it doesn't grow, it's unstable in terms of its topography. It's likely to shake itself loose and then collapse. When a lava dome collapses, it generally forms what we call pyroclastic flow. And pyroclastic flows are one of the most dangerous volcanic hazards on the planet. On October 25th, the Indonesian government raised the alert to its highest level as Merapi started to erupt. At least 19,000 people living within a 10 kilometer radius were ordered to evacuate the danger zone. Mount Merapi is certainly one of the most heavily monitored volcanoes in Indonesia. It has a dedicated team there 24 seven. The next day, Merapi exploded. That was not so surprising. Small eruptions occur every two to three years. Larger ones every 15 years or so. What was unusual this time is how Merapi erupted. Now the 2010 eruption was different in that the magma seemed to be more charged with volcanic gases. And that produced a very significant explosion that produced a lateral blast of rock, debris and volcanic ash material that then hurtled down the volcano as pyroclastic flows. A pyroclastic flow is a fast-moving torrent of hot gas and rocks that can reach speeds of up to 700 kilometers an hour at temperatures exceeding 1,000 degrees Celsius. The searing gases and high speed make them particularly lethal as they incinerate all in their path. If you're not killed by just a blow to your body by one of the fragments, you will suffocate because of inhalation of gas and or cooked because the temperature of the flow is so high. To explain why Merapi is so explosive, we need to understand what's happening deep beneath the Earth's surface, in the engine room of volcanoes and earthquakes. The Earth's crust is made up of various pieces called tectonic plates that are always in motion. That's why the continents have shifted and changed throughout deep geological time. Tectonic plates raft on the mantle beneath, jostling and buckling at the edges where they collide. Where plates slowly buckle upwards, they create new mountain ranges or continents. Where they're pushed underneath their neighbor, the crust is recycled. As the downgoing plate goes deeper and deeper into the Earth's mantle, it heats up and parts of it begin to melt. And it's those batches of molten rock or magma that begin to rise upwards through the overriding plate and then eventually erupt on the Earth's surface, forming a line of volcanoes that constitutes what we call the Pacific Ring of Fire. Trace the edge of the Pacific Ocean, and you'll find it surrounded by an almost continuous 40,000 kilometer long series of fault lines. It spans the entire circumference of the Pacific Ocean and contains nearly 80% of the Earth's active and dormant volcanoes. There are 129 active volcanoes in Indonesia alone. Merapi is one of them. But what makes it so explosive? Typically, what we find is that at the convergent plate boundaries, we can generate magmas that are very sticky. And those magmas can hold a lot of gas. And it's the gas phase that provides a lot of energy that can drive really explosive volcanic eruptions. The reason there's so much more gas dissolved in a ring of fire magma is because we're recycling seawater and other compounds that can be volatile. 
There's a huge difference in volume between dissolved water and water as a gas. And as that gas expands, it drives the explosive eruptions. All but three of the world's largest eruptions in the last 12,000 years were volcanoes in the Ring of Fire. Merapi is one of them, and it's not finished yet. It is also not alone. The Pacific Ring of Fire runs right through Japan. Like Indonesia, Japan has a dense population of over 100 million people, living with more than 100 active volcanoes. In fact, the landscape of Japan is an archipelago of stratovolcanoes. Located 200 kilometers west of Tokyo, Mount Ontake is Japan's second largest volcano, after Mount Fuji. A popular destination for hikers and tourists, Ontake's last significant eruption was in 1979, with no loss of human life. For 35 years, the mountain remained quiet, until the 27th of September, 2014. Several hundred hikers were enjoying the upper reaches near the summit, when suddenly, the unthinkable happened. A few minutes before noon, without any warning, Ontake exploded. Thunderous booms split the quiet air as one side of the mountain ripped apart, spewing hot ash and toxic gas. So Mount Antaki was a large eruption and it was an unforecasted eruption or it was not predicted to occur. It was definitely a surprise for the Japanese Meteorological Agency. Antake's eruption was not forecast because the usual seismic activity preceding an eruption caused by magma straining against the Earth's crust did not occur. Antake's explosivity originated in superheated steam in what's known as a phreatic eruption. For steam-driven eruption, which is when we have a body of magma that comes up through the surface and interacts with a body of water, that could be groundwater or it could be surface water. Water gets superheated to steam, it's under pressure. And if that pressure builds up so that fractures can be opened to the Earth's surface, then that pressure is immediately released as an upward explosive surge of hot water steam and in the process, a lot of fine rock debris from those new fractures is broken off and also ejected together with the steam. A lethal maelstrom of scorching gas and pulverized rock burst out of the volcano's flank in a pyroclastic surge. And, of course, any of the hikers who were up in the near-summit region were inundated by this cloud, this flow of debris and steam that reached up to three kilometres radially from the source vent. The day after the blast, more than 200 first responders were deployed in rescue efforts. But due to Antake's continued activity, rescue efforts were hampered. Uh, 
準備はしっかりしておりますので、ちょっと自然の力には。離れないそういったことを現実を突きつけられるという可能性が出てきます。A month after the initial eruption, the death toll was finalized at 63. Six of the hikers' bodies were never recovered. The danger of these explosive eruptions is obvious. They're powerful, unpredictable, and destructive. But even relatively calm and docile volcanoes can be damaging. Famous for its spectacular and frequent lava flows, the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park attracts 2.5 million visitors each year. The most popular attraction is the active Kilauea volcano, the longest continuously erupting volcano. In recorded history. So the eruption has been taking place for 35 years, since 1983. It's a relatively comfortable volcano to visit because a lot of the activity is relatively slow moving. There are places where the lava flows, and it's dominated by lava flow activity rather than、uh, explosive activity. But this relatively comfortable eruption is only comfortable relative to other volcanoes. In May 2018, New fissures split the landscape, geysering lava 50 meters into the air, burping corrosive gas, and hurling lava bombs. At this time, it's about two miles away and is traveling at 100 yards per hour. 2,000 residents have been forced to flee as the inexorable approach of the lava flow swallowed 6,000 hectares of land, and it continues to grow. I was hoping that my house wasn't going to get destroyed, but I guess God had other plans. It is tragic, and in another way, it's it's really beautiful because it's it's absolute destruction and creation at the same time. Whether lava runs steadily onto the ground as an effusive eruption. Or shoots into the air in an explosive one, is due to what the lava is made of, how much gas is dissolved in it, and how viscous it is. Unlike the Ring of Fire volcanoes, Kilauea's lava originates deep within the Earth's mantle. This means it is much less gaseous and much more viscous than their Ring of Fire counterparts. The Hawaiian volcano sits in the middle of a plate. It's associated with a hot spot, which is a plume of magma that's come up from very deep in the earth. That causes enhanced rates of of melting of the mantle, and as the mantle is being melted, it's creating lots of magma, and that magma gets to the surface of the crust. This magma is so hot that it begins boring a hole through the Earth's crust. They just punch through where they want to. Biggest flux of material coming out on the Earth's surface in one of these hotspot volcanoes is Hawaii. It builds up a type of volcano that we call a shield volcano. So these are some of the largest volcanoes on Earth, but you only see the very tip of them poking out through the ocean, a bit like the tip of an iceberg. A shield volcano is formed from layer upon layer of cooled lava. The division between these layers are weaker than the surrounding rock. And the lava, under extreme pressure, squeezes through, cracking the rock and creating fissures. In 1983, one of these fissures signaled the beginning of Kilauea's eruption. Nothing can stop the lava. If it comes, it comes. Lava flows are never predictable. The amount of gas that's coming out is never predictable. On the scale of a ring of fire type volcano, the explosions are nowhere near as vigorous. Or reaching up into the stratosphere, but nevertheless, on a human scale, they can be quite lethal. And people have been killed in the past by explosive events.、It、makes you feel sort of helpless, really, and、uh, there's nothing we can really do about it.
The gentle sloping sides characterized by shield volcanoes are in sharp contrast with the iconic shape of the stratovolcano, generally the most destructive type. So a stratovolcano is basically the typical kind of volcano that everybody thinks of when they think of a volcano in their mind. It's that conical shaped volcano that's built up by lots of repeating layers of lava or pulverised rock fragments. As debris, ash and lava spew forth with each eruption, stratovolcanoes grow in scale. It's this massive layer cake of hardened lava and volcanic ash that can make stratovolcanoes eruptions especially destructive. That's why the evacuation um, radiuses are so important for volcanoes, where we have lots of evidence that's told us that that volcano has seen this kind of activity in the past and it has the potential to do it again in the future. For the stratovolcano Merapi, the evacuation radius of 10 kilometers proved insufficient as it began its second phase of eruptions. A week after it started, lava bombs and pyroclastic surges billowed down the mountainside. There were definitely volcanic bombs associated with activity at Merapi. It's a common kind of volcanic phenomenon that we come across with stratovolcanoes. They're basically these chunks of semi-molten magma that come flying out of the volcano. They basically follow a ballistic trajectory. Ash blanketed the landscape. Livestock choked to death. Villagers who initially refused to budge from their farms on the volcano's fertile slopes started streaming by the thousands into makeshift emergency shelters. Volcanic ash, you have to remember, is not like your backyard barbecue ash. It's not carbon-based, it's silicon-based. It's going to cause irritated eyes and irritated nose and throat. If you have prolonged exposure, then it's going to mix with liquids and waters within your body, and it's going to form a kind of cement in your lungs. By November 6th, nearly two weeks after the initial eruption, the exclusion zone was increased to 20 kilometers, and nearly 200,000 people had been displaced. Being on the ground near an erupting volcano, there are enough lethal hazards to worry about. But as thousands flooded out of Merapi's exclusion zone, authorities were also concerned about its effects further afield. We have very dense flight routes, and particularly throughout the Asia-Pacific, we're getting more and more potential for the impact of, of volcanic ash on aircraft in flight. As you fly over a country like Indonesia, you've got a situation where you've got hundreds of active volcanoes that could potentially generate a volcanic plume at any time. The volcanic ash being ejected, at times tens of kilometers into the air, wreaks havoc on aircraft machinery. So volcanic ash does a lot of damage to aeroplanes in, in a few different ways. With minor exposure, you can get what's called sandblasting over the windows and the visibility drops to zero. 
perhaps most damaging of all is that the volcanic ash goes into a jet turbine engine, it melts into a liquid form, it coats all the componentry, and it eventually leads to the engine stalling. A nightmare scenario that in 2010 caused major disruptions in Europe. Iceland is no stranger to volcanic activity. Its mountainous interior is scarred by lava flows, active vents, and steaming calderas. This geological activity attracts thousands of tourists every year to the island of ice and fire. Iceland has a lot of volcanoes, and because they have explosive eruptions almost every decade, they're very good at monitoring volcanoes and understanding the warning signals that volcanoes give. Eya Fjallajoko was no different. Seismic activity around the ice-capped volcano began in 2009 and steadily increased until the 20th of March, 2010. The first phase of the eruption was actually uh, very benign. It was low-level uh, lava fountaining that produced very local hazards, particularly to tourists who were doing self-guided tours to the active lava flow front. When I heard about the volcano eruption, I decided I, I wanted to come here, so I just booked for a weekend and I just came to see the volcano. And it's been amazing. I still have itchy eyes because of the volcanic ash. That was good. I did enjoy it. About 500 residents were evacuated out of the glacier-bound volcano shadow overnight. The amount of people that are coming here, that they don't know the area, they are getting maybe evacuation uh, messages for the first time. Will they know what, how to react? That's our biggest challenge. On April 13th, an earthquake swarm signaled the beginnings of Eyjafjallajökull's second phase of eruptions. Having a glacier over the top of an active volcano basically leads to conditions where you can get far more explosive activity. So the magma heats up the ice, the ice melts, the water cools the magma, and it results in a very, very explosive eruption. The volcano would continue to erupt until June, in which time it ejected an estimated 250 million cubic meters of volcanic ash into the atmosphere. During the Eyjafjallajökull eruption in 2010, the winds were very unusual and they brought all the ash from Iceland into the European airspace and all the way to Africa. It only took ash to about 10 kilometres in the atmosphere, which is not significant compared to other volcanoes around the world. But it was high enough to be entrained into the jet stream and carried towards continental Europe. Most European countries closed their airspace during this event, and for six days, we had over 100,000 flights cancelled, 10 million passengers affected, and something like 48% of all air traffic across the globe impacted by this event. An estimated cost to the aviation industry of 1.7 billion US dollars. Yeah, it's a bit frustrating because you're standing queues for hours and then you get to the end of the queue to be told that there's nothing available and there's no trains, no planes, and nothing. I can't get back. Um, so I've got seven days to wait or try and get home another way. Eyjafjallajökull's eruption invigorated research into mitigation methods. Along with experimental ash detection devices, early warning systems and global communication networks have been employed. 
There's a network of nine volcanic ash advisory centres that work in partnership around the world to provide warnings to aircraft when volcanic activity is either expected or is ongoing using satellite imagery and also using observations from the ground. Usually we can warn with minutes to spare for aircraft already in flight and once that initial eruption has happened and all planes are either diverting around it or are grounded then the, the hazard associated with it drops off significantly. As Merapi's eruptions continued into its second, third, and fourth week, chaos reigned in Java's airports. Volcanic eruptions can last from days to months to years. The average volcanic eruption duration is between three and nine months. People who stayed during the 2010 event, the government were continuously warning and giving predictions on what conditions they could expect on the volcano. They were urging for evacuation. The majority of residents did evacuate from the zones that were of greatest hazard, what they call the red zone in Indonesia. And the Indonesian government at the time had a very difficult job in trying to convince residents that the threat was real and that it was in their best interest to move away from the volcano, even just for a short period of time. Faced with such dangers, why did locals resist the evacuation orders? For many, the risk of leaving their ancestral holdings could be just as dangerous as the threat Merapi represents. When you talk about hazards, living on the slopes of one of these things is not necessarily the wisest choice in terms of if there's available real estate. But of course, most people live on these things. They have no choice. That's where they are. They're the only places that they can either afford to buy land or they squat and just occupy the land. Those plots of land, which they usually use for farming, agriculture, are their only possessions in life. And so those owners are often very reluctant to evacuate. Worldwide, hundreds of millions of people take a potentially devastating risk by living on or near active volcanoes. The reason so many can survive here, ironically, is because of the volcanoes themselves. Essentially, the whole surface is made out of volcanic materials. Largely, that material weathers and degrades very quickly and begins to form very fertile soil. The particles of ash release all their elements, so those particles are available for plants to extract as nutrients to generate their growth. Weighing up the risks, families and communities must decide for themselves if making a living under the shadow of a volatile volcano is worth their lives. The ash that blanketed the surrounding communities of Marapi would, in generations, make the farming soils nutrient-rich and fertile. But in the days that followed, the area was suffocated and broken under its weight. Industry shut down, schools were closed, and millions of dollars worth of farmland and crop were ruined. Kondisinya udah rusak lah ini. Ini ekspor ke, uh, dikirim ke Jakarta pun ini udah udah enggak udah apa udah rusak lah ini. Udah bisa enggak bisa lagi kita ngomong. By far the most widespread impact of the Merapi eruption was the volcanic ash fallout. That fallout extended many tens of kilometres away from the volcano. Close to the volcano, it was a matter of volcanic ash burying villages, burying crops entirely and those sorts of areas still remain uninhabitable today. Untuk Dusun Kinah Rejo sendiri, ya seperti inilah, hancur 80% rumah roboh. 
with millions of people living and relying on volcanoes, the need to understand their processes is vital. In 1991, the Decade Volcanoes Program was established. The Decade Volcanoes were originally designed to look more closely at the way particular volcanoes that present risks to population centers could be better studied, that potential hazards could be mitigated in the event of new eruptions. <laughs> kegempaan, angin, suhu udara, tuh, dan mungkin ada perubahan morfologi puncak itu juga perlu dilaporkan. The idea was to get scientific and civil defense experts together, pool their knowledge, and plan ahead to manage the next natural disaster. 16 volcanoes were selected for the program, one of which is Merapi. The work of the Decade program has given researchers some very powerful tools. It has led to improved evacuation plans and even diversion tactics. One such diversion tactic is the construction of dams. Dams to mitigate not lava, but another deadly volcanic hazard. Coinciding with the eruption of Mount Merapi, heavy rains doused the area. As residents and rescue workers looked on, millions of tons of volcanic ash was loosened from its resting place and washed downriver, reaching speeds of up to 60 kilometers an hour. Filling the protection dams and traveling over 15 kilometers from the summit, only one death was attributed to the Lahars. Forward planning and strategies like the Decade program proved invaluable. Volcanic mud flows are a common phenomenon associated with volcanic activity. But often, they do not occur until well after an eruption has finished. One of the, the corollaries of fragmenting material and putting all that stuff over the surface of the earth can be mobilized by rainfall. And what that stuff then turns into is mud flows, or the Indonesian term for it is lahar. These often actually cause greater loss of life in many eruptions. Precariously dusting the steep slopes of volcanic ranges, the millions of cubic meters of ash and debris is incredibly unstable. Once mobilized, lahars, or little waves in Javanese, can shred trees, lift boulders, and bury cities. In 1985, the Armero tragedy saw 23,000 people killed when lahars racing at 50 kilometers an hour buried villages and towns at the base of Nevado del Ruiz in Colombia. It occurred at night, nobody knew it was coming. Silent but deadly, it was a very effective killer. People had no way out of that. Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, inundated by heavy rains, saw an eight-meter lahar surge down its slopes in 1995, four years after its last major eruption. Every year they get this season of monsoonal rains. And so every year for the next decade, 
these rains would remobilise the ash in the environment and transport it down waterways. Unless you're there, the immense power of volcanoes is hard to visualise. But imagine an explosive eruption so strong it blew a 1.6 kilometre crater in a mountain. Flung pyroclastic flows at supersonic speeds. And four metre lahars that transported nearly three million cubic metres of mud, 27 kilometres. Mount St. Holmes hadn't erupted for about 100 years, so it was on schedule for an eruption to occur. Mount St. Helens in 1980 proved to be the deadliest and most economically destructive volcanic event in the history of the United States. Mount St. Helens was fascinating because it erupted in such a way we hadn't seen before. There was clear indications that trouble was brewing at Mount St. Helens before May 1980 in terms of seismic activity, there was a bulging of the north face of the mountain, which did and should have given people lots of warning that something really bad was about to happen. And I say bulging, it was moving a metre or more a day. Now, in terms of ground motion, that's incredible. Things don't move generally in terms of solid crust of the earth at that kind of rate. There's a very great hazard due to the fact that the glacier is breaking up on this side of the volcano, on the north side, and that could produce a very large avalanche hazard. An exclusion zone was set, but few locals took heed of the danger. There's nothing to be scared of. More danger than one of them trees falling on the backside than there is a mountain of exploding. A magnitude 5.1 earthquake directly beneath the north slope set off the largest recorded landslide in history. The release of all that rock from that pressure on that new body of magma that was developing in the volcanic edifice, and that then allowed the volcanic gases to suddenly boil explosively and trigger a major explosive event. We are directly over Mount St. Helens right now, and there is no question at all that the volcanic activity has begun. You can see smoke and ash pouring from the top of the mountain, especially on the north side of the mountain. All eruptions are compared using the Volcanic Explosivity Index. The VEI is a scale for volcanoes based on how much material is thrown out, to what height, and how long the eruption lasts. It's a scheme between zero and eight, where zero is a non-explosive eruption, and eight is responsible for some of the mega-colossal largest events that we've seen on the planet. Each interval between two and eight is actually logarithmic, meaning that it's 10 times worse than the interval before it. The VEI of Kilauea is zero, very gentle. At a VEI of three, Antake's 2010 eruption is 1,000 times greater, with Marape another 10 times greater again. Mount St. Helens was a five on the Volcanic Explosivity Index, making it about 100,000 times more explosive than Kilauea. Not one, but several pyroclastic flows traveled at near supersonic speeds and covered huge distances. Typically, when we think of a volcanic eruption, we think of an eruption blowing vertically out the top of the volcano and, and up towards the sky. In the case of Mount St. Helens, the volcano blew laterally or sideways. It formed an instantaneous amphitheatre, which then directed the initial explosion largely sideways, producing a 
a new type of pyroclastic flow that we hadn't really been aware of previously that we now call a blast flow. It flowed up to about 40 uh, kilometres from the, from the volcano. It flattened all the uh, Douglas pine forests that were in the immediate vicinity and beyond the zone where the tree trunks had been flattened and aligned in the direction of that blast flow. There was also a large envelope or area beyond that where the vegetation was singed and burnt, um, indicating that the temperature of that blast flow was at least 300 degrees centigrade. Most of the 57 people known to have died that day were suffocated by ash and gas, while several died from burns. At the time of the eruption of Mount St. Helens, there was actually quite a bit of snow on the summit. And also prior to that 1980 eruption, there were several small summit glaciers. Now the eruption would have actually mobilized most of that snow and also shattered the glaciers on the summit. And that then eventually transformed that, what we call a dry rock avalanche, into a mud flow or debris flow that then caused quite a lot of damage for distances of up to 60 kilometres downstream from the volcano. Mount St Helens initial eruption spread ash over 6,000 square kilometres covering 11 US states and costing billions of dollars worth of damage. For Marapi's 2010 eruptions, the human cost was enormous. 353 people had been killed, hundreds injured, and thousands more were suffering from conditions brought on by ashfall. Almost 200,000 people had been displaced and incalculable damage done to their homes and livelihoods. After six weeks, Marape finally quieted enough for authorities to downgrade the alert level and let locals return. But Marapi is a restless sleeper, and it is only a matter of time before it awakens again. People get lulled into a sense of security that if there hasn't been an eruption for a while, well, maybe the, the volcano has become long-term dormant or even extinct. But of course, the timescale of human life and experience is much less than the timescale of most volcanoes. Reducing hazards for people means learning what to expect from volcanoes, often the hard way. This we get from studying each eruption, now and in the past. Collaborative studies like the Decade Volcanoes Program can provide clues as to where the next disaster might erupt. By tracking where the earthquakes are migrating, you can effectively track the path of the magma to accurately predict the onset of that eruption. And clues in the geological record can also provide a greater understanding of volcanic events. There were so many different phenomena that then left their marks in the record of the deposits that scientists could then go and study. We rely a lot on that kind of behavior to predict what it might do next time. It's not always a guarantee, but it certainly helps to understand what it might do. In the end, when it comes to volcanoes, no matter what we know or how prepared we are, we must always be ready for the completely unexpected.
The boundaries between Earth's oceanic plates are alive with seismic activity. Ready to trigger one of the deadliest natural disasters known to man, a tsunami. Jesus Christ, look at that. When monster waves hit coastal populations, kidding, kidding, kidding. their power is unstoppable. This earthquake and the tsunami is much larger than they had thought could be generated at that subduction zone. Multiple assaults carry loved ones away. We hope against hope that they're still alive somewhere. Inundating land for more than three miles. Life has gone. The place has been destroyed. And leaving a catastrophic death toll. They'll still be finding bodies now, I would imagine. They would never have recovered everybody. Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? December 26th, 2004. Deep below the waves, off the western coast of Sumatra, the sea floor was ripped apart by a massive earthquake, measuring an average moment magnitude of 9.2. That was one of the 10 largest earthquakes ever recorded, and it was the third largest since 1900. This earthquake ruptured a huge fault. It was about 1,200 kilometers long, um, all the way up along the subduction zone in the Sumatra region. As the fault unzipped directly opposite Aceh province, its capital was rocked by powerful tremors. The panicked residents of Banda Aceh flooded into the streets as their homes crumbled. But the worst was yet to come. Millions of people around the Indian Ocean were about to be overwhelmed by one of the deadliest natural disasters in recorded history. The earthquake violently shoved the seafloor upwards at a speed of 10,000 kilometers an hour. This is one of the classic tsunami generating earthquakes. They call it a subduction zone event where two plates grind against each other, one's pushing the other one down, and, and then it essentially flips up and bang, that generates a wave. A very large subduction zone earthquake might displace the water by four or five meters, which might not sound like all that much, but it's doing it over hundreds, if not a thousand kilometers area. So it's a major disturbance to the ocean's surface, and that's a lot of energy. The displaced energy transferred into the surrounding water, triggering a powerful wave. And that wave, because it's in deep water, doesn't really have anything to slow it down. So it's going very fast. We're talking 800 kilometers an hour. The tsunami sped toward the Aceh coastline. Those who could fled. But for many, it was too late. The torrents of water and rubble dragged thousands to their deaths and continued to surge inland. It's not just one wave, it's multiple waves. And they're coming at a coastline with such force. And when they inundate or flood that area, they can travel up riverways, they can travel up other bodies of water. 
And in particular, in the case of Banda Aceh, it actually came from two directions. It came from the west and also came around from the north. So there were accounts of people who ran one direction only to find that they were facing the tsunami coming from the other direction. Comprised primarily of fishing communities, most of the immediate victims in Aceh were women and children. A lot of the women and children were located close to the coast. So the children may have been in school and the women may be at home or working in agriculture. And the men may have been out at sea fishing. Some of those fishermen may have been completely unaware of the horrors unfolding at home. A large tsunami in the open ocean might only be a couple of meters high and might even go unnoticed by ships at sea. But when it approaches shore, it undergoes a phenomenon called shoaling, where with all the energy that's in that deep column of water gets compressed. So you have what's a small wave in the deep ocean, about 50 centimeters. And then when it's coming on shore, in the case of 2004, probably about five meters high. Some of the waves that hit the northern tip of Sumatra exceeded 30 meters, flattening the coast. However, the island was just the first in the firing line. The tsunami was speeding toward Thailand, where beach resorts across the south were packed with tourists enjoying an end-of-year vacation. The tsunami travels about the speed of a jet plane. So if you imagine flying in a jet plane across an ocean basin, that's about the speed a tsunami travels. Although that's enough time for a proper warning system to deliver a warning to communities, it's not that much time. Unaware of the cataclysmic rupture 500 kilometers away, holiday goers at Patong Beach in Phuket witnessed a strange phenomenon. The sea was receding. As the tsunami approached, water was getting pulled back to feed the wave. That wave is building up. The one behind is pushing like crazy. This wave is getting bigger and bigger. It's slowing down. That crest is growing. And then suddenly it turns around and starts coming back towards you. And it comes in so fast, you cannot outrun that. An hour and a half after the earthquake was first registered, the tsunami hit Thailand, where tourists in Phuket bore witness to the wave. I was fine. I knew I was high up. It was a good, strong building. The, the waves were rolling. I thought, yes, yeah, fine, it's fine. <laughs> Jesus Christ, look at that. Jesus Christ. It wasn't a wave. It was just solid water behind it, and it just kept coming. That wave oh is a good God. 15, 20 feet tall. Easy. Nothing was going to stop that wave. It breaks a long way offshore, so you just have this roiling mass of hell, you know, up to about five metres high, zooming towards you at about the speed of a 5,000-metre Olympic runner. So can you outrun that? Just hit, and there was devastation. Boats getting smashed everywhere, people being washed away, uh, just carnage. Water rushed into hotels, in some cases, inundating the third floor. Rooms filled up in 30 seconds. One of our friends had to throw the TV through the window to climb out. There's cars gone through shop windows, trucks being blown over. The destructive power of the tsunami was unstoppable. Each cubic meter of water weighs a ton and the waves from the Indian Ocean delivered 100,000 tons of water to each one and a half meters of coastline. The power is unbelievable. Just back there, there was a, a, a tractor, and it's nothing against the power of the wave. The event is chaotic because a tsunami destroys everything. It doesn't pick and choose. It doesn't say, oh, I'll leave that house behind, or I'll leave that kid behind. 
He was lost for two hours. The flood washed him away by himself. What and he hung onto a door in the hotel until the water came down and came out two hours later. Of the Thai areas hit, Khao Lak suffered the worst, with 4,000 perishing. But the tsunami would continue, sweeping across the Bay of Bengal. Two hours after the earthquake, and 1,700 kilometers from the epicenter, Sri Lanka was next. Resorts near the coastal city of Matara were assaulted by waves. It burst through the door. And we were lacking other rooms. It burst through the whole wall and just washed in, at which stage we just left everything and ran. When Sri Lanka was hit, a railway train on the coastal line was crowded with passengers. At the village of Peralaya, the first of the gigantic waves arrived. The train stopped as water surged around it. People felt that the train was going to be a safer place to be than to be on the ground. Not necessarily a very good choice. It's a bit like people being in a car when the tsunami comes. You know, a car's full of air, a train's full of air, it's easy to pick up and throw around, and that's exactly what it did, essentially. And probably in the region of about 1,500 people were drowned, crushed. <laughs> In terms of the death toll, it became the world's single worst train disaster, adding to a confirmed death toll of over 35,000 people. <laughs> An estimated 90,000 buildings across Sri Lanka were destroyed. The southeastern part of Sri Lanka and the south part were the worst hit, most definitely. Uh, you could see uh, inundation going well over a kilometre inland. A lot of the tourist hotels on that part of the coast, you couldn't see them anymore. It was just a layer of rubble disappearing into the distance. The seismic shock of the 2004 earthquake rang the earth like a bell, causing the entire planet to vibrate by as much as a centimetre. It was recorded as a moment magnitude 9.2 event, a scale used by seismologists to compare the size of earthquakes. Magnitude's a number that's logarithmic, and what that means is every time you step a magnitude unit, you're increasing the motion by about a factor of 10 and the energy by about a factor of 30. Before the moment magnitude scale was developed in the 70s, we really relied on the amount of shaking that was observed in an earthquake to determine how big that earthquake is. But the moment magnitude scale is important because it relates to actual physical properties of the earthquake. It's proportional to the area of the fault that ruptured in that earthquake and also the amount that fault moved in the earthquake. The Sumatra quake was the third most powerful ever recorded. However, a tsunami triggering event in 1960 released almost three times the energy. The most powerful earthquake ever recorded is a magnitude 9.5. It's called the Valdivia earthquake, which came in sort of southern central Chile. On the 22nd of May, South America was throttled by a quake lasting over 10 minutes. rubble and ruin in the Pacific port of Concepcion in Chile, where she has suffered the worst series of earthquakes in all its history. The 
problem with that event was that it was so big that it was outside anything that had happened before. Waves up to 25 meters assaulted the Chilean coast. There's a big debate as to how many people died in 1960 in Chile, anything between about 1,000 and 5,000 people, which is a huge range. Bearing in mind it was not a particularly well-populated coastline, that's a lot of the population, because they simply couldn't get away. The tsunami waves would continue to propagate across the Pacific. Waves were recorded 10,000 kilometers from the epicenter, as far away as the Philippines. It killed people in the United States. It killed over 100 people in Japan, 61 people in Hawaii. Uh, it inundated the coasts of New Zealand. It was a phenomenally big event. As with the 2004 Sumatra tsunami, the Valdivia event was triggered by a megathrust earthquake. Megathrust earthquakes occur on boundaries between oceanic plates and continental plates where you have the oceanic plate subducting beneath the continental plate. And in this region, you can store a massive amount of energy over a large area. That ocean plate that's diving into the Earth's mantle, it actually does uh, uh, gets bent through a quite a large angle. That causes huge stresses to build up within that plate. When that stress is released, it does so violently. So you get this movement of a huge fault at shallow depths beneath the ocean. And that's what causes the tsunami. In 2004, the earthquake and resulting tsunami killed an estimated 230,000 people in 14 countries around the Indian Ocean. Part of the reason for the horrific death toll, people were not aware that a tsunami was coming and didn't expect one. There was a real problem with education and preparedness in this case. So many of the people in that area weren't aware of tsunamis and didn't know to use the natural warning signs as a signal that they should evacuate. A catastrophic tsunami wasn't expected in the region even though there were warning signs. There was evidence from geological studies of corals along the Sumatra coast, as well as historical accounts of large tsunamis. After investigating this, we did think that, that there was reason to have a warning system in the Indian Ocean, precisely because you could get these major events occurring there. Early attempts were made to establish a warning system, but it was not felt as a priority. It was going to take a while to get governments to pay attention to this when they had so much else to worry about in the Indian Ocean. As the waters started to recede along coastal Thailand, the true scale of the devastation became clear. Nearly 8,500 people were injured in that country alone, many requiring severe medical attention. I've gone by ambulance six hours the whole night, and now wait 10 hours and then 10 hours flight. I think then I will be really ill. But among the havoc wreaked by the tsunami, there were those beyond the reach of emergency services. And when an earthquake happens, it can be devastating, but you know, usually it's, it's not such a huge area and you have some idea of where the casualties are and where you need to rescue people. Whereas with the tsunami, they have these huge debris fields and you have no idea where people might be either dead or alive. Search and rescue crews combed debris alongside volunteers and families searching for their loved ones. Family members posted flyers with pictures and descriptions of those missing. At this point, we're hoping against hope that they're still alive somewhere, hoping that they're not unconscious and can't speak or, or something like that. But within days, the chances of finding people alive faded dramatically. 
think after five days, I think they they died. Bodies continued to wash up on beaches three days after the tsunami. Rescue teams turned into retrieval crews. Bodies can be swept quite long distances. Bodies can be trapped in trees, in branches, in brush, and indeed can be located in places where you would not expect to find a body. So you will often get a situation where bodies are recovered perhaps weeks or months later in unusual places that were not subject to a detailed search at the time. The dead were wrapped in tarps as workers sprayed chemicals to prevent the spread of disease. As the death toll climbed, the international impact of the disaster became clear. Countries, let's say, like Sweden, they had more people die from that event than any natural disaster they've had in their own country. In Thailand, multinational forensic teams started the arduous process of identifying the deceased. Uh, at this time, we have Australian team, German team, and French team. They can help us to under, uh, identify all the foreigners. It was a collection of 5,000 bodies in one place, all drowned, all black, all swollen, all looked the same. And you couldn't tell whether someone was from Africa or from Indonesia or from Thailand or from Sweden. They all looked the same. Most of the people who die in this die from drowning, but also it's blunt force trauma. They get smashed. You get picked up by this thing, they get smashed into brick walls. A brick wall smashes into them because it's picked up by the tsunami. Initially, we were told we just need to separate the locals from the foreigners. The only time you could do that is if a particular local person had on a hotel uniform, for example, with a with a name tag or something that they belonged to a particular resort. So. That was given up and it was decided that all 5,000 bodies will be treated exactly the same. So every single person would have a forensic pathology examination, a forensic dental examination, a fingerprint examination. So the process started of one body at a time doing those examination procedures. I couldn't even tell you how many dentists were on the ground at any one time, but it would have been 50 or 60 working out of a converted Buddhist temple. With temperatures reaching 39 degrees Celsius, the waterlogged bodies were quickly decomposing. And we had to convert this Buddhist temple into a makeshift mortuary with plywood walls and air conditioners. Since the 2004 tsunami, authorities contacted over 4,000 relatives to come and receive bodies. However, not all could be identified. There's probably four to 500 still unidentified bodies in shipping containers buried in the ground just north of Phuket to this day. In Thailand, the tsunami killed around 5,400 people. But while the international media focused on tourists who perished in resorts, many locals were left to salvage the broken pieces of their lives. It sometimes takes great tragedy to forge a new path ahead. I think the tsunami really was a catalyst for change in the way that the international community responds to 
large-scale disasters like this one. The United Nations mobilized and secured agreement to establish an Indian Ocean tsunami warning system. When this earthquake occurred, it was clear that we needed to be able to respond quickly and accurately to large earthquakes. When you have an earthquake of five and a half and larger, it's observed by instruments all around the world. The initial alerts for earthquakes can come out in five minutes, but it's important to get that information out as quickly as possible for tsunami warning to give people a heads up of what happened. This boy can save a lot of lives for the people living in Indian Ocean. The new system, which became active in 2006, can provide those around the Indian Ocean with the kind of warning that may have saved lives in 2004. In the advent of an abnormal wave, sensors on the ocean floor register a change in ocean pressure. This information is transmitted to buoys on the surface, then a satellite which passes the data onto a monitoring center for distribution. As well as sending warnings out to the public, officials, and the media, the centers will record data that can influence evacuation plans and save lives. The warning centers can then start to look at some of the models that they've run before. And they have taken those models to all the different coastlines that will be affected and show how bad that wave will be inundating that coastline. So immediately you've got a lot more information about where to evacuate. In terms of tsunami safety and education, no other country is more prepared than Japan. Nestled toward the top of the Pacific Ring of Fire, Japan is a volatile hub of seismic activity. Minor tremors are almost a daily occurrence across the islands, with around 1,500 earthquakes striking every year. 2,500 dead and missing is the toll of the earthquake and tidal wave that swept over a 200-mile stretch of shore along the northeast coast of Japan. Residents are trained to respond to tsunamis and the earthquakes that cause them. The country even has an early warning system. Earthquakes emit two types of waves. Primary waves, which cause weak tremors, and secondary waves, which cause the bulk of earthquake destruction. The faster moving primary waves can travel up to eight kilometers per second. Seismographs on the surface register this motion, triggering alerts which are sent to homes, offices, and schools, providing precautionary instructions for the oncoming secondary wave. A warning such as this was transmitted across Japan in early 2011. On the 11th of March, an undersea megathrust earthquake measuring a magnitude of 9.0 struck 130 kilometers east of Sendai. It was the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in Japan. 373 kilometers from the epicenter, citizens of Tokyo received a minute's warning before skyscrapers began to sway. The earthquake was so intense, it shortened the length of the 24-hour day by 1.8 microseconds. The main rupture occurred over an area of only about 400 kilometers, and it had a huge amount of slip relative to previous earthquakes. In the 2004 Sumatra earthquake, 
the maximum amount of relative displacement was around 20 meters. The Japan earthquake caused 70 meters or more slip over that relatively small area. And because that slip happened right at the shallow part of the earthquake fault, it was very effective in generating a large tsunami. A Japanese Coast Guard patrol ship was one of the first to encounter the tsunami a few kilometers offshore. The wave continued toward the northeastern coast of Japan, where people were bracing for the impact. Japan is the most tsunami prepared country in the world. Was it prepared for the 2011? No. They had done modeling and they had inundation maps and they had evacuation centers. They had evacuation routes where you should go. Fundamental mistake they made was they didn't think there could be an event that big. The initial warnings that went out talked about a wave smaller than the wave that was actually coming. Part of the problem was people not understanding what those wave heights were going to be, how far they had to go to be safe, and how quickly they had to do it. And in many cases, they had very little time. Many of the tsunami shields offered little protection. There are some places along the Tohoku coast where massive tsunami barriers have been constructed, and those were designed to prevent a tsunami of the maximum that was expected. In some cases, the barriers failed completely. And so those sea walls essentially became uh, material for the tsunami to move around. They then became battery rams. In Miyako City, tsunami waves reached run-up heights of 39 meters, as narrow bays focused the onslaught of water. When a tsunami enters human population areas, the first thing it's going to do is essentially go along what is the path of least resistance, so it'll go up the rivers, and it'll go down the streets. Across coastal centers, people clambered atop buildings, hoping their structures could withstand the oncoming torrents. When it comes across a building or something like that, it'll build up on that, just like when you see with a, a river in flood, it's flowing down, it's piling up and piling up and piling up. And if it has enough energy, that building falls over and it's gone. In the case of a tsunami, it is an incessant, continuing surge of water coming in, and it's picked up an awful lot of stuff to bring with it. Desperate survivors in Kameishi watched as cars and fishing boats assaulted their places of refuge. Barely an hour after the initial quake, waves were surging over the Sendai Plains, two kilometers inland. Cars racing from the onslaught could barely move faster than the oncoming debris. In some places, the tsunami bore inland more than five kilometers, leaving a trail of utter devastation. Starts off with total destruction, and as that starts to decrease, it starts to leave behind the stuff that it picked up as it started to move inland. Across the world's most tsunami-prepared country, an area of approximately 560 square kilometers was inundated. It's his, his house, here. Even people in some evacuation centers died, and they'd done the right thing. Among the areas affected, at least 101 designated tsunami evacuation sites were hit. 
この度の東北地方太平洋沖地震はマグニチュード 9.0 という例を見ない規模の巨大地震であり被災地の被災な状況に深く心を痛めています。The Tohoku earthquake shifted Japan's main island of Honshu 2.4 meters east. As the confirmed death toll began to climb, those unaffected prayed that lost ones would return. <laughs> Forty-five thousand seven hundred buildings were destroyed, and one hundred and forty-four thousand were damaged. Towns were transformed into unrecognizable rubble. Sendai was in the direct firing line. Of both the earthquake and the tsunami. Days after the waves, industrial complexes still burned, fueled by ruptured oil storage tanks and liquefied natural gas stockpiled at the port. Over four million homes across Japan were left without electricity. <laughs> In heavily affected areas, survivors searched in vain for missing relatives. International emergency crews combed through wreckage. Marking empty structures with an X if they failed to find bodies inside.、And、the idea is to slowly progress through the, all the buildings and vehicles to make sure there's no persons missing in them. The earthquake and tsunami claimed over 15,800 lives. More than 2,500 on top of that were recorded missing. Amongst the severe pain and loss, there were a few stories of hope, as lucky families were reunited. Scars left by the tsunami would take years to heal. However, the waves brought further destruction on the 11th of March. Some of the area's worst hit were about to bear the brunt of what was fast becoming a rolling disaster. Tsunami よりも一番怖いのは原子力なんですよね。On the day of the tsunami, just 66 kilometers from Sendai. Several thousand people were being ordered to evacuate. Multiple reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant were going into meltdown. There was a lack of understanding on the part of Tokyo Power and its regulators about the vulnerabilities associated with the plant. The TEPCO plant had survived the earthquake, and the tsunami warning system had shut down the reactors, switching power for the cooling mechanisms to the backup diesel generators. 
but the generators were rendered inoperable as the waves swept over the 5.6 meter tsunami barrier. Fukushima had a seawall. It just wasn't big enough. Simple as that. And again, this comes back to the fact that they were prepared for an event that was smaller. In the case of the Fukushima reactor, the tsunami knocked out the auxiliary power supply. And so the reactor was not able to shut down and ended up, you know, going into meltdown. A total of three reactors at the plant started overheating. Pressurized hydrogen gas building up in two of the containment buildings caused a series of explosions. Radioactive material was now leaking from the plant. Workers toiled to cool the reactors with water cannons and seawater dropped from helicopters. At the end of March, the evacuation zone expanded to 30 kilometers around the plant. Fractures in the plant's trenches and tunnels caused radiation to leak into the ocean. Close to the plant, levels of radioactive iodine-131 were measured at 7.5 million times the legal limit. The appearance of increased levels of radiation in some local food and water supplies prompted Japanese and international officials to issue consumption warnings. Lines stretched for blocks as parts of the country experienced food and water shortages for the first time since the Second World War. Farmers across Japan struggled as demand for their produce dropped, even in areas unaffected by the crisis. Across the exclusion zone, crops and livestock were abandoned and left to die. In Sendai, the fishing industry collapsed, leaving many communities, already devastated by the waves, to grapple with radioactive emissions. On the seventh anniversary of the disaster, TEPCO revealed that it had reduced the rate of contaminated water reaching the reactors from 400 tons per day to 100. One million tons of radioactive water still sits at the site, waiting for authorities to determine how to dispose of it. The Fukushima incident was the worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl in 1986. A parliament-appointed investigation committee concluded that the disaster was man-made, the result of collusion between the government, regulators, and the operator of the plant, Tokyo Electric Power Company. There was a reluctance on the part of the utility to address tsunami safety, in part because this seemed to be such a low probability event that its likelihood was discounted. 
もちろんその作業というのは10年をはるかに超えて30年そんなことまで言われるような長い作業になってまいります Today, areas closest to the plant stand frozen in time, as people fear to return to some sectors that the government has deemed safe. Japan will continue to carry the horror of the Tohoku tsunami for decades to come, but it has the wealth and facilities to slowly heal. For those in less economically stable areas, recovery is not always so certain. The 2004 tsunami ravished some communities around the Indian Ocean so badly that many would never be the same. Apart from the loss of life, the environmental and economic impact was enormous requiring global assistance to rebuild. Rallying together, the international community donated $14 billion in aid across affected countries. In the five years following the tsunami, the International Federation of Red Cross Societies alone provided nearly 5 million people with assistance, rebuilding 51,000 new houses and restoring nearly 300 hospitals and clinics. One of the issues also in the Indian tsunami was the state of the coastal mangroves and other ecosystems that were degraded. And so there was an effort to restore and to plant more mangrove forests around the coasts. Revitalized mangroves create a buffer between communities and any coastal hazards. There's now a big drive from many organizations to promote nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches because it creates a lot of benefits, not only in terms of risk reduction, but also in terms of livelihoods and sustainability. We like to empowering the people to look after their environment by themselves. To effectively grow back communities, experts require a comprehensive picture of the destructive potential of seismically triggered waves. The first accounts of a tsunami date over 4,000 years ago. But in the last two decades, we've experienced two events unprecedented in scale. We can't predict exactly how big and where an earthquake will be, but we can predict regions that are potentially closer to having a very large earthquake. Earthquake-prone coastal areas need to look to recent tragedies and prepare for the inevitability of the next tsunami. While the Indian Ocean and Tohoku tsunamis left trails of disaster, they also provided data that could one day save lives. We could trace the entire inundation of this tsunami all the way through five kilometers inland. We can now say to you, okay, once every X number of years, you're going to get a wave this big coming through. We can only hope that we are better prepared when disaster strikes from the sea once more. <laughs>